Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Now today's topic is uh, high blood pressure, an extremely common problem today, sometimes affecting uh, very young people, occasionally even children, but in 30s and 40s, it has become uh, so common. And uh, uh, it is uh, one of those things uh, which uh, just next to overweight, perhaps, gives us a warning that something is wrong and uh, that we need to relook at our lifestyle, particularly the way we look at life, the type of goals and aspirations we have in life, because that is what eventually affects both our sense of well-being as well as uh, physical health, including uh, our body weight and uh, the blood pressure and other things that we are talking about in this series. So with that background, let me turn to the PowerPoint. Quite common for a person to go for a medical checkup, sometimes for something else, and then the blood pressure is taken and the person is told that he has high blood pressure. You know, commonly in Hindi, you would say, Mujhe blood pressure ho gaya hai. You don't even say high, but with your blood pressure. Ho gaya. And uh, there is a certain amount of worry that goes with it because quite possible the doctor might have prescribed uh, some pills and the doctor has told the person that you'll have to take these pills the rest of your life. Now, the impression that this gives, I have developed high blood pressure, looks uh, like an event, a tragedy that somehow suddenly happened. But in fact, uh, having high blood pressure is a process. It's not an event. It's a process that began long ago, several decades before it was perhaps diagnosed. And uh, it is this slow accumulation of damage over decades that uh, finally led to this high blood pressure, which might be still silent and uh, de uh, detected quite uh, accidentally. Maybe the person went to the doctor for something else. Now, what that process is, which uh, leads to high blood pressure, is what we shall focus on today. But before we do that, uh, let's uh, try and understand uh, what is blood pressure. The heart is like a pump, and uh, the left ventricle, which uh, pumps the blood to the entire body, uh, sends the oxygenated blood that has returned from the lungs to the whole body. Uh, pumps this blood through this uh, curved horseshoe shaped big blood vessel, the aorta, which in turn has branches going to the uh, different parts of the body, towards the head, and as it comes down towards the abdomen and the legs. Uh, so it is uh, the blood pumped from the left ventricle into the aorta that gets distributed to the whole body. And as this blood is pumped at a high pressure so that it can uh, travel all the way up and down up to the smallest of uh, arteries, say, in the feet, uh, it has to be pumped forcefully. And as it is pumped forcefully, that uh, forcefully pumped blood in these blood vessels exerts a pressure on the walls of these blood vessels. And uh, that is what uh, is blood pressure. So the blood pressure develops as a result of this pumping action of the heart, uh, generating a pressure in the walls of the uh, tubes through which it is being pumped. Showing it pictorially, this is the left ventricle pumping the blood into the aorta, which has all these branches going to the whole body. And uh, that is what uh, gives us this pressure in the aorta and the arteries. And still more pictorially, so this is a pump. The blood is being uh, pumped into a series of tubes. And you can see that uh, as uh, it uh, goes through these tubes, uh, uh, the blood pressure will keep the pressure within will keep falling a little bit, but then uh, it has to be considerable. The pressure has to be considerable for it to be able to reach the very end. Now, you might have seen that uh, when the doctor writes the blood pressure, the doctor writes two pressures, say 120 by 80. 120 on top and under that 80, or sometimes called 120 over 80. Now, what are these two blood pressures? Now you can see that uh, the pump does not pump continuously. How could it do that? It has to stop for a while to receive blood, to get full again. So here is a chamber uh, which is acting like a pump. 
sending blood through these tubes. And while it is sending the pressure, it builds up in these uh, vessels, but then it becomes empty. So it has to get filled. So when it is getting filled, this opening is closed and uh, the uh, blood keeps flowing because of the pressure that has been generated. And as this travels, it gets spent along the way. So the, there is a pressure that develops when it is pumped. And then once the pumping stops because this chamber is getting full, the pressure comes down. So it goes up when the pump works, that is the ventricle contracts, and comes down when the ventricle is relaxed and is filling up. So these are the two pressures that would develop. But then the pressure does not uh, drop, rise and drop as much as it does in this picture. The real picture is closer to this. Now, how does that happen? Now, visualize uh, a balloon here, an elastic balloon, uh, which is uh, here. And therefore, when the blood is pumped, part of the force is spent on inflating this balloon, making this balloon wider. And when the pumping stops, then uh, because of this elasticity, the balloon starts deflating. Or you can visualize it as it starts closing on the blood within. And uh, the result is that uh, the blood, it's ensured that the blood will continue to flow because of this elasticity. So although the pumping has stopped, the blood in a way got stored here because of the elasticity. And now that stored blood continues to uh, let the blood flow throughout these tubes right up to the end because now because of its elasticity, the balloon is becoming smaller and smaller. And that is the blood that is going. And the result is that uh, uh, the blood pressure or the pressure in this uh, entire network of tubes does not rise as much as it otherwise would have. It does not rise as much because it's not uh, being entirely sent through these tubes. Some of this uh, pressure is getting absorbed because of the balloon getting inflated because of its elasticity and therefore pressure does not rise as much as in this picture. At same time, it does not fall also as much as here because uh, of the uh, elasticity of the balloon, which continues to uh, generate a pressure of its own, sort of acts as a mini pump by closing on this and letting, uh, exerting this uh, pressure so that the blood continues to flow. So it does not fall as much as over here. So this is the pressure during the contraction of the ventricle or during pumping. This is the pressure when the ventricle is relaxing and uh, getting filled. So this is called the systolic pressure and this is the diastolic pressure. Systolic, say 120 and diastolic 80, this is when the ventricle is contracting, this is when it is relaxing. Now we can also understand therefore that uh, if uh, the elasticity here is reduced, then what would happen? It will become a little closer to this, which means the pressure would rise more when the blood is pumped and uh, will fall more when the pumping stops. Now, to some extent, reduction in the elasticity of the arteries is a part of the aging process. So to say, you know, in the uh, layman's language, you say the arteries become stiff. They don't uh, they lose their elasticity to some extent. They become stiff. And therefore, when the blood is pumped by the heart, it, the arteries cannot accommodate that much and therefore the pressure rises more. And then because of the same reason, uh, now there's not much scope for closing on this blood and therefore the pressure drops more than it would, it becomes closer to this picture. So an increase in the systolic pressure and an increase in the pressure between the systolic and the diastolic, which is called the pulse pressure, both these increase to some extent with aging. But then aging is a process that doesn't follow the same curve in everybody. It can be slowed down. And therefore, it's not inevitable that the pressure would rise in uh, many. It does not rise that much even with age. So, but all the same, it's understandable how reduction in the elasticity of arteries, which is a part of the aging process. You know, with age, all functions decline, including the elasticity of the arteries. And that is what gives rise to a higher systolic pressure. Since diastolic pressure is something which we don't worry about that much, uh, we'll, and we shall see why, 
this increase in the systolic pressure sometimes is called isolated systolic hypertension. That's only the systolic pressure is high. And uh, sometimes the diastolic pressure might have also increased to some extent, uh, not as much as it would have. So the reduction in the diastolic pressure because of loss of uh, elasticity gets compensated by an increase in the diastolic pressure because of other reasons. And so the diastolic may still be within the normal range. So that's how we get isolated systolic hypertension. And that is the commonest type of hypertension in people above 65 years of age. Now let's see a little more mathematically this whole process. The blood pressure is equal to cardiac output multiplied by peripheral resistance. Now, what is this cardiac output? Cardiac output is the amount of blood pump. So, one can understand more the blood pumped, more would be the pressure generated. Now, what is this resistance, peripheral resistance? Resistance offered by the network of tubes. So, more the resistance offered, the greater will be the rise. Now, what is the resistance due to? Because of the narrowing of the arteries. One can visualize, you know, easily that suppose uh, a pump is sending water through a series of hose pipes in a garden. Now, more the blood that is pumped into these hose pipes, these pipes which are connected to the pump, more will be the pressure generated. Also, if the tubes through which it is going are narrow, the pressure will rise. For example, suppose there's a wide tube through which the, the water is flowing and we squeeze it or put a nozzle in front which has a narrow opening. Suddenly you find that when there was no nozzle, the blood was flowing limp. You know, the fall was limp, which means it was not uh, going very far and uh, the, because the pressure was not much. The pressure had uh, dropped by the time it reached that level. But if you apply a nozzle or you squeeze it with your finger, suddenly whoosh, you know, it goes like a jet. And uh, that's because uh, the opening has become narrow and uh, now the pressure is higher. It comes out at a higher pressure. Therefore, it goes like a jet. It goes to a longer distance. So these are the two things that would determine the blood pressure, the blood pumped and the resistance offered. And uh, one can see that uh, the initial pressure which is generated when the pump is working would influence mainly the uh, pressure at the time of pumping, when it is being pumped, that is the systolic blood pressure, when the ventricle is contracting in terms of the heart. Whereas uh, the resistance offered will affect more the extent to which the pressure drops uh, during the uh, pressure drops when the blood is not being pumped or the water is not being pumped. So uh, we find that uh, you can again visualize the same way uh, the water being pumped through a series of tubes in a garden. Uh, if uh, you do not have the nozzle and you stop pumping, then very soon the flow will stop, which means the pressure will drop to zero. Whereas if you have that nozzle, even after you stop, because of that narrow nozzle and high pressure, the blood will continue to flow for some time, which means that the diastolic pressure, pressure when the blood is not being pumped, will depend more on the resistance offered. Now, both these have uh, a sort of a place in understanding high blood pressure because uh, the systolic blood pressure would depend more on the elasticity of the arteries. Whereas the diastolic pressure will depend more on the how narrow or wide the arteries are. And uh, while the elasticity is a part of the aging process, reduction in the elasticity and affects the systolic pressure more, the narrowing of the arteries due to deposition of fatty substances in the walls is uh, more of a pathological process. It's not an inevitable part of aging, but all the same, to some extent, some fatty deposits would form in just about everybody. One can't expect to have clean arteries like a newborn. And uh, when the process is faster, then the deposits can be so much as to give a pretty high diastolic blood pressure. And we give greater importance to that because uh, it is the deposition of fatty substances in the arteries which also tells us that a similar deposit 
would have happened in also some of the vital organs. It's not that uh, we are measuring it uh, in the artery in the arm and that's only the place where it has happened. It has happened all over. It's a generalized process, the position of fatty substances. It would have happened in the heart, which can give heart disease. It could have happened in the kidneys and that's what can give, a, give kidney disease. It could have happened in the brain. That's what can give a stroke. So it is the diastolic blood pressure which tells us that the pathological process, the disease process of the deposition of fatty substance in the arteries has reached a considerably therefore this is a warning for other things that could happen, the so-called complications of high blood pressure. Now this just gives a, a pictorial representation of the blood being pumped into the aorta and its branches. And here we have these fatty deposits which have narrowed down the passage. We already discussed this. Why is the diastolic pressure considered a more important indicator of high blood pressure? More important because the risks associated are more. It tells us that a similar process has taken place in so many vital organs and therefore one or the other of the organs could uh, perhaps suffer damage uh, in the form of a heart attack or chronic renal failure or a stroke. Because the systolic, another reason is that systolic blood pressure can rise temporarily due to a variety of causes. It's not only the aging process, but let's say a person is uh, angry, agitated, even then the heart you know, beats faster and harder. Uh, and that also raises the systolic blood pressure more because that is because of the more blood being pumped. The, uh, the peripheral resistance, that is the resistance offered the, by the blood vessels may not change that much. Because say, if a person is taking exercise, the blood is pumped, more blood is pumped and therefore systolic pressure can go up. But then the resistance offered may not have changed much or might even go down because the arteries in the muscle, sorry, arteries of the muscles, muscles which are active during exercise, those arteries would have widened up to increase the blood flow to the exercising muscles. So that will actually bring down the resistance offered in the muscles. And uh, therefore, the diastolic pressure may not rise. In fact, it may fall a little because of the opening of the arteries in the muscles. So systolic pressure can rise temporarily due to a variety of causes like exercise, anger, excitement, agitation, etc. On the other hand, diastolic blood pressure gives a better idea of the degree to which the arteries have got narrowed down due to fatty deposits. Now, that is also the, explains why repeated readings are required before making the diagnosis of the high blood pressure. The person might arrive after walking, so exercise. Then the person may be worried, do I have high blood pressure? Now, worry and anxiety also raise the, uh, make the heart pump more blood because of the sympathetic nervous system becoming more active. Then, you know, while the blood pressure is being taken, the presence of the doctor in front of him, the blood pressure cuff around his arm, and the fact that uh, he's worried about what the reading will be. Will it be high? Will I be labeled somebody with a high blood pressure? Will I have to take pills the rest of my life? Now, he's thinking of all these things. And therefore, the blood pressure, but the systolic blood pressure is, may go up because of these reasons. It's not a permanent thing. It's a temporary process while the blood pressure is being recorded. And because uh, the presence of the doctor and being in the hospital environment or the doctor's chamber contributes substantially to it, sometimes called white coat hypertension. You know, the doctors usually wear a white coat and uh, white coat hypertension. And therefore, what we need to do is Firstly, put the patient at ease. Secondly, take repeated readings because as the person gets accustomed to that environment more and more and uh, feels that, yes, the blood pressure may not be permanently high, it may be only a temporary thing, he relaxes. And when he mentally relaxed, while the blood pressure is being taken, the subsequent readings might be lower. So that's why we need repeated readings, uh, not only on the same day, but sometimes also on consecutive days for a few days before uh, seeing that the person actually has high blood pressure. Because the blood pressure can rise temporarily due to a variety of causes, some of which are a part of normal fluctuations. Normal fluctuations due to 
anxiety, et cetera, or exercise. Uh, also, time of the day could affect the blood pressure. So it's a sustained rise. That is a rise that is maintained that qualifies as high blood pressure. And therefore, repeated readings are required. Now, once we know what the person has, what, how much blood pressure the person has, which is quite stable and sustained. Now, within that, how high is really high? Now, these guidelines have been changing. And uh, now, an inevitable rise in blood pressure uh, with age is not considered an important factor. So, more or less, for all age groups, the criteria are the same. And, uh, and these are the guidelines provided by the National Health Service of the United Kingdom. And uh, uh, what uh, they have, the final sort of uh, criteria, which naturally have to be clear cut, that they've arrived at are that the ideal blood pressure is between 90 by 60 and 120 by 80. So, you know, sometimes 120 by 80 has become such a uh, sort of a standard thing that if a person's blood pressure is 90 by 60, the person feels I have low blood pressure. But that is not low. Low is lower than 90 by 60. So, 90, so the range is pretty wide, 90 by 60 to 120 by 80. High blood pressure is considered to be 140 by 90 or higher. Now, this is a more comprehensive chart worked out by, uh, by the American Heart Association. And uh, it's similar, but then uh, it has all these grades. Normal, less than 120, and uh, here diastolic, less than 80. Elevated, 120 to 129, and less than 80. High blood pressure, stage 130 to 139, 80 to 89. High blood pressure, stage 2, 140 or higher, 90 or higher, and hypertensive crisis which means consulting a doctor immediately becomes necessary higher than 180 and or higher than 120. So even one of these will qualify, both or any one of these will qualify as hypertensive crisis. This we have already discussed to some extent. Does blood pressure rise with age? To some extent, yes, but uh, doesn't have to. So the answer is yes. It does rise in most of the people who have been studied. And those who have been studied are primarily in the Western countries, people who are even, even in the developed countries, people who are uh, staying in cities and so on. And uh, but it's found that it does not rise actually in people who live a primitive lifestyle, whom we do not reach in these research studies. Which means that lifestyle contributes even to the age-related rise in the blood pressure. So those living a primitive lifestyle generally, and some people have gone to the extent of saying that just one factor, adding extra salt to our food makes all the difference. If a person has never added table salt, some people go to the extent of saying if a person has never added table salt, and of course with that will go the other aspects of the primitive lifestyle. If a person has never added table salt to his uh, food, then his blood pressure at 70 will be exactly the same as age 17. That is absolutely true. And just one thing that salt can make that much difference is debatable. But uh, the idea is to drive home the point that primitive lifestyles are normally associated with no change in the blood pressure with age. But at the same time, in uh, a develop, the developed world, by age 70, more than three quarters of US adults have hypertension. American adults have hypertension. Now, once again, coming to this question, how high is really the hypertension may be labile, which means that it is sometimes there, sometimes not there. It shows those fluctuations, and uh, this may become easily detected if the readings are really repeated, and then the person goes for a periodic checkup. And uh, this is isolated, isolated systolic hypertension. This is primarily due to the reduction in the elasticity of the arteries and uh, if it is sustained. And iso a, a temporary rise in the systolic high blood pressure alone could be because of exercise, anxiety, etc. But if it is sustained and can be labeled isolated systolic hypertension, that is primarily because of the reduction in the elasticity of the arteries. 
then isolated diastolic hypertension. Uh, this can also happen. That is primarily because of the deposition of fatty substances in the arteries. And uh, hypertension during pregnancy. Any woman might develop uh, a little increase in their blood pressure during pregnancy because uh, the sex hormones uh, which go up to very high levels, they skyrocket during pregnancy. And uh, while that is not their most important effect, their effects are primarily on the reproductive organs, uh, these uh, steroid hormones, you know, these sex hormones are also steroid in the broad, they belong to the broad category of steroids. Now, these sex hormones, uh, one of their unintended, perhaps, or less desirable effects is they could raise the blood pressure. So, any woman can get hypertension during pregnancy, and usually it returns to normal after the baby has been delivered. But all the same, hypertension during pregnancy does deserve a little more special consideration. Now, let's see different uh, aspects of it. If the woman already had hypertension before becoming pregnant, then it could worsen during pregnancy. And if the hypertension was present before pregnancy and the woman was on medication for that high blood pressure, medication might have to be reviewed because some of them, the drugs given, may not be safe during pregnancy. They were safe for the woman, but they may not be safe for the baby. And therefore, medication might have to be reviewed. If hypertension developed during pregnancy, the woman did not have blood pressure, high blood pressure earlier, but she develops it due to pregnancy. This is a simple situation relatively because it does have, can happen to many women because of the actions of the sex hormones which skyrocket during pregnancy. It may remain just that. That is hypertension during pregnancy and return to normal after delivery. But all the same, it may not be as simple as that. In any of these above situations, there's a possibility of serious complications involving various organs with grave risk to both the mother and the baby. And one of the first indications of this serious complication is the appearance of protein in the urine, which indicates renal damage. Normally, we do not have protein in the urine because the filtration process, the process of filtration in the kidney ensures that this will not happen. The protein molecules are too big to pass through the filter in the kidneys. So the place where the blood is getting filtrated to uh, initiate the process of urine formation, so the place where this uh, blood is getting filtered, that filter in the kidneys does not allow big molecules like protein molecules to pass. And therefore, there's no protein in the urine. But when that filter is damaged, which means that the kidney is damaged, protein could appear in the urine. And that is why throughout pregnancy, you might have seen during antenatal care, these are two important things that are done repeatedly, measurement of blood pressure and urine examination becomes even more important if the woman has developed high blood pressure during pregnancy or had it already before pregnancy. In any of either of these situations, uh, repeated measurement of blood pressure during pregnancy is an important part of antenatal care and uh, also desirable particularly if high blood pressure has developed during pregnancy, to examine the urine for the presence of protein. Because it could be the first warning of more serious complications, which can be a grave risk to both the mother and the baby. Does hypertension run in families? Whether it is high blood pressure or heart disease or high cholesterol levels or diabetes, these are all diseases for which the risk is increased by a large number of genes. So the inheritance is not a single gene, uh, but because of inheritance is because of a large number of genes. And when that is so, then even if the disease has been running through the family, it is only a tendency to develop the disease that is inherited, which means a greater risk. Now, whether the tendency or increased risk will actually manifest in the form of the disease depends a lot on the lifestyle. One can delay the manifestation by having a healthy lifestyle. So if the delay is so much that the person can delay it to 70 or 80 years of age, it's as good as not having inherited it at all. So it's not hypertension itself, but a tendency to develop hypertension that is inherited. At what age the tendency would manifest? That is actually show up as high blood pressure depends on the lifestyle. 
Now, one of the things that is common to a wide variety of lifestyle diseases is inflammation, particularly in the arteries of various organs. And uh, this inflammation is not the type, you know, when one gets hurt and one develops a swelling which is red and hot and uh, the temperature it is warm. You know, these are classical signs. Of it's not that type. It's a subclinical, low-grade inflammation. Doesn't have the classical signs of inflammation that is redness and swelling and warmth and so on. It is chronic low-grade inflammation uh, and that can turn into a silent killer because it is low-grade, doesn't have those classical signs of inflammation that contributes to cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes and many other conditions. Now, this is from uh, uh, the Harvard Medical School where uh, health education sort of efforts. And they say that this chronic inflammation can be stopped through seven, can be stopped to seven simple steps. Pay attention to your diet, eat a healthy diet, what is good for health in a quantity that is just right, neither too much nor too little. Remain physically active, manage your body weight. That's a good indicator of uh, the diet and exercise being or energy intake and expenditure being properly balanced. Get enough sleep, enough sleep and also at the right time and right quality of sleep. Don't smoke. If you smoke, stop smoking. Limit the use of alcohol and conquer chronic stress. Like you see, essentially it always comes down to those same factors no matter where you go, whom you talk to when it comes to lifestyle. The important thing is whether one does it out of uh, fear of disease and death or whether one enjoys doing it. That is what will, to some extent, determine the level of stress. Because the person is doing it out of fear of disease and death, that fear itself is stress. There may be many other types of stress in life. And then all these things which involve major changes in the lifestyle may be inconvenient to the person, yet the person is doing it for the sake of living a little longer. Now that itself creates stress. Some of the things the person enjoys, he has to give up. He may enjoy sleeping till late in the morning. He has to get up early in the morning. The person may enjoy enjoy omelets and cutlets. The person is being uh, forced to take green vegetables instead. Now, all this can cause chronic stress. And uh, the stress resulting from the so-called deprivation, the person being deprived of things that he enjoys. Uh, this deprivation, the stress due to this deprivation, may contribute more to the diseases than the good that this healthy lifestyle might do. And uh, therefore, the important thing is chronic stress. And for that, the most potent, infallible prescriptions that we have are in ancient spiritual disciplines like yoga. So that is where yoga enters everywhere. Now let's see the symptoms of hypertension. Usually it is symptomless and that is why it's called a silent killer, but there may be a headache. Now, how does the headache due to hypertension differ from the headache due to sinusitis? The location of the pain, location of the headache, sinusitis is strictly not in the head. It is more behind the nose and in the behind the eyes. And the time at which it is at its worst. Headache due to hypertension is usually at the back of the head and is at its worst on waking up in the morning. It becomes less and less as the day progresses. On the other hand, hypertension due to sinusitis is usually more behind the nose and eyes and is at its worst in the afternoon and evening. Now let's have a look at the other symptoms apart from headache, which hypertension might give. These are late symptoms. That is after the hypertension has been there and has not been treated for a long time. And uh, then the person may go with some of these symptoms and the blood pressure might be detected. Tiredness, dizziness, palpitation, you know, feeling that the heart is beating, you know, feeling the heartbeat you know, rapidly and forcefully. And importance, breathlessness on exertion, swelling around the ankles. Now, these are uh, breathlessness or exertion, swelling around the ankles they indicate that perhaps the heart has also got involved in the process. Then regional symptoms such as bleeding from the nose, too much pressure in the arteries in the nose, bleeding. Then absence attacks, that is 
the because of the arteries of the brain, the person may not get a stroke, but the person may just suddenly feel as if he couldn't think of anything. He couldn't. Uh, uh, he was not fully conscious, but just in a split second, he recovers. He did not actually fall, or the attention again returns. But transient ischemic attacks, as they are called. Ischemia, reduction in the blood flow, transient. So these absence attacks. Now these could be some of the symptoms because of the involvement of uh, particularly the heart and uh, because of the brain. And these may be the uh, symptoms that take the person to the doctor and then the blood pressure is detected. Now, high blood pressure begins slowly, silently, without a warning. Symptoms come pretty late and progress is still the leak without being noticed to become a threat to life. That's why it's called a silent killer. And therefore, it is recommended that blood pressure be checked up every alternate year after age 30 and every year after age 40. And of course, the mother of most cardiovascular diseases, including high blood pressure, is overweight. And uh, correspondingly, if an overweight person who has high blood pressure may be able to come back to normal blood pressure just by losing weight, not necessarily by becoming uh, uh, completely sort of thin and lean, but uh, just losing 5 or 10 kilos, even if the person is still now on the stocky side, that may be the person's basic constitution. Uh, just by losing 5 or 10 kilos, the person's blood, uh, blood pressure may come down to normal. Now here is this uh, actor, Ron Perlman. I lost 90 pounds and my blood pressure went down to a normal level and the salt in my urine disappeared. And uh, well, I mean, what he means is, you know, that um, he was uh, perhaps eating too much salt earlier and if the urine also had more salt, uh, salt from the urine will not disappear completely. Uh, and that was when I had to make, after all, he's an actor, he's not a doctor. But important thing is when he just lost 90 pounds, his blood pressure came down. Nothing else was required. And therefore, he had to make a transition from a fat character actor to a thin character actor. <laughs> now, why is hypertension called a silent killer? Because it can lead to complications which can kill. And those complications are heart disease, kidney disease, and stroke. And blindness may not kill, but then one can understand it's a serious complication. Now, what are the risk factors for stroke? Of course, all lifestyle factors. But uh, once I heard a talk by Professor Srinath Reddy, a friend and a, a eminent cardiologist, uh, he said that uh, there are three major risk factors for stroke. The first is hypertension. The second is hypertension. And the third is hypertension. So hypertension is the top risk factor for stroke. Stroke, you know, means uh, that the arteries in the brain have either burst at some point and there's bleeding, cerebral hemorrhage, or uh, they have got blocked so that the blood supply to a part of the brain has stopped completely and has led to the death of a part of the brain tissue. That is an infarct has developed there. The way it happens in the heart during a heart attack, during myocardial infarction. So one of these things, either an infarct or bleeding, Either of these would be called stroke. And uh, for stroke, the most important risk factor is high blood pressure. Uh, treatment of hypertension. Firstly, one has to make sure whether it really is hypertension through repeated readings when the person is relaxed. Is it sustained or is it labile? So after making sure that the person actually has sustained high blood pressure, uh, it's permanent, then we have, to think, we have to think of treatment. Now, in treatment, one has to decide between sometimes medication and going to the root of the issue. Now, to understand this, let's uh, take an analogy. Suppose uh, the car has broken down and uh, on the way while you are driving, then what would one do? Uh, one may get hold of a few boys, young people, 
who can push the car up to the workshop. Now, this is acting on the end result. What is the end result of whatever is wrong with the car? We still don't know what is wrong with the car, but the car is not moving. It is stopped. So the end result is the car is not moving and uh, by pushing it, it moves. But then this is not the solution. It has to be taken to the workshop. That is where the mechanic will go to the root of the issue and see what is wrong with the car. Now, in the same way, the blood pressure can be brought down through a pill. That is like getting these young people to push the car. Now, if uh, one boy is tired, we, or the one set of boys is tired, we get another set of boys. In the same way, the action of one pill is over. The duration of action is eight to 12 hours, most of these pills, so they have to be taken twice a day. So uh, one, boy is, uh, one set of boys is tired, you get another set of boys. One pill uh, is not acting anymore, its duration of action is limited, you take another pill. So another pill is like getting another set of boys. So, so long as uh, you keep replacing one set of boys by another, the car will keep moving. The end result will be not that the car has stopped, the car will move. The end result has been taken care of. So, so long as one takes regular medication, the blood pressure will remain normal. But then what is the root of the issue? The root play in the lifestyle. Now, Till we reach the workshop, we need these boys. So which means till the root has been addressed, we do need the pills. But then the root is, here the analogy breaks down with the car. Because if the root of the issue is lifestyle, the, something went wrong with the lifestyle 30 years before the blood pressure developed. So it's the slow accumulation of damage over 30 years that has given high blood pressure. Just by correcting the lifestyle today, one does not expect the blood pressure to disappear tomorrow to come down to normal tomorrow. Hmm? So something which has developed over decades will take at least a year or two uh, to return towards normal as a result of adopting a healthy lifestyle. And some of the damage may be permanent. And even after being on a healthy lifestyle for a year or two, it may not come down to normal. All what it may mean is it will require less medication. So medication gives us time. It buys us time. It works on the end result, therefore reduces the complications like uh, stroke, etc. So the compli complications can be prevented even by acting on the end result, that is the blood pressure itself. But then along with that, if we also go to the root of the issue and adopt a healthy lifestyle, then the blood pressure will not go up further. Secondly, modif lifestyle modification is not acting only on the blood pressure, it is acting on uh, all the lifestyle diseases, you know, something like uh, if you want to dry up uh, uh, one piece of laundry hmm, and you hang it in the sun, it takes three hours. If you have 10 done and hang them, that also takes the same time. So you didn't need, so you don't need anything extra to prevent 10 lifestyle diseases, the same lifestyle modification uh, adopted for high blood pressure will also decrease the risk for heart disease and diabetes and stroke and cancer, etc. So by lifestyle modification, we will be able to uh, reduce the blood pressure over a period of time, but still it may not come down to perfectly normal, but the dose of medication required would be less, which means fewer side effects. And therefore, it is not either or, either lifestyle modification or pills, both have a role and both may be necessary. Particularly if uh, the damage is severe and has been going on for a long time, then both may be necessary. Uh, and both are necessary, even if some medication has to continue because it will, the lifestyle modification will reduce the dose of medication required and will also prevent other diseases from developing in future, other lifestyle diseases from developing in future. Now, one of the uh, concrete things asked often is, should a person having high blood pressure stop having salt? This is an inherited trait. And because of this inherited trait uh, uh, quality, uh, the blood pressure may be salt resistant or, or, not, or not resistant, salt insensitive or salt sensitive. 
Some people are more sensitive to salt and uh, therefore in those people, salt might be making an important contribution to the high blood pressure. If they stop having salt, it can help a lot. But uh, those who are not salt sensitive, those who are salt insensitive, it may not make much of a difference whether the person is or is not taking salt. However, in anybody who has high blood pressure, if the person takes less salt, even if it does not give up completely, the blood pressure does come down to some extent. So there are two types of hypertension, salt sensitive and salt insensitive. About 60%, and that's a substantial majority, about 60% of those having hypertension respond favorably to salt restriction. So irrespective of what type of hypertension they have, salt sensitive or insensitive, if you mix them all up, around 60% of those who have hypertension will benefit from salt restriction, which means a little less salt in the vegetables and dal, etc. And also avoiding or stopping altogether high salt foods. And which are the high salt foods? Important among them are chutneys and pickles. So no uh, sensory indulgence through chutneys and pickles will itself restrict salt intake. Treatment of hypertension should go, in fact, beyond lifestyle modification. As you know, we have been discussing in these modules, these talks repeatedly, that it's not just lifestyle modification in concrete terms, which is important. It should be a wake-up call for uh, any disease which is detected. It should be a wake-up call for uh, having a relook at uh, life itself, the meaning of life, and therefore, our priorities in life. Uh, here is this uh, a person who, apart from being a psychiatrist, David Hawkins, apart from being a psychiatrist, he's also a spiritual guide and uh, has written a beautiful book, The Power Versus Force, The Anatomy of Consciousness. And he says that is one thing to prescribe an antihypertensive medication for high blood pressure. It's quite another to expand the patient's context of life so that he stops being angry and repressive. So it is uh, these characteristics, being angry and repressive, uh, which uh, are taken care of by letting the spiritual worldview guide our life. Then you find that the reasons for being angry and repressive disappear completely. Uh, instead of being uh, ego-centered, which is at the root of these tendencies, we become more love-centered and love-driven. And uh, the result is that the blood pressure does not rise. We can prevent it instead of needing treatment. Uh, that reminds me of George Pickering, uh, a rather uh, old you know, time a, a cardiovascular physiologist, who had uh, given a model for... Uh, how a person develops high blood pressure. The person has a way of looking at life that makes him repeatedly angry and repressive. So sometimes what is summed up as hostility. You know, hostility, ego-centered, highly competitive, with negative traits like uh, competitiveness, unhealthy competitiveness, and uh, jealousy and uh, anger and uh, a desire to control others and so on. The person who has these negative tendencies finds many occasions and excuses for being uh, for being angry, etc. during the day. The result is that every time he does that, his blood pressure goes up, then it comes down to normal. But then if it keeps happening several times a day for several years, then this high blood pressure becomes sustained. And that is when the person is then, we can, in spite of repeated readings and everything, we find that the, the, this person definitely has high blood pressure. But why did this person develop this high blood pressure? Because he had a way of looking at life which made him angry, agitated, hostile, cynical every day, several times a day for several years. Now, is there anything like low blood pressure? Having it permanently, below say 90 by 60, which we saw is uh, in the lower average limit of normal. But there could be individuals in whom it may be still a little lower and still they may be completely normal. Uh, 
because the person gets accustomed to a low blood pressure, the person gets accustomed to some extent also to a higher blood pressure. And that's why we have a range of normals. So permanent low blood pressure, which is so low as to give symptoms, is extremely rare, almost unknown. But temporary attacks of low blood pressure are pretty common. And what are the symptoms of these temporary attacks? First, there's a warning. The person feels dizzy and the person might fall, faint and fall. Now, fall is in a way, nature's way of telling the person, treating the person. Because you see, the dizziness and fainting is because of the reduction in the blood flow to the brain. And that happens before it uh, blood flow fall, falls to the legs. Firstly, blood flow reducing, a reduction in blood flow to the legs will not matter much. Not as much as reduction in, to the brain. On the other hand, reduction in the blood flow to the brain occurs earlier because that requires the heart pumping the blood against gravity. It has to be pumped upwards. So it's against gravity. And therefore, whenever this temporary attack comes, the first thing that happens is that the blood flow to the brain drops. The person feels dizzy. If he doesn't pay any attention, he faints and falls. Now, if he falls, he's flat, horizontal. And therefore, now the blood to the brain doesn't have to work. Uh, blood to the brain doesn't have to be pumped against gravity. Now, gravity is not involved. So, the blood flow to the brain improves. The person can recover. However, this is not the best way to treat. Of course, nature has built in this protective mechanism, which is helpful. But then, the fall may lead to other types of serious injuries. And therefore, one has to heed the warning and do something. That is what is important. Now, what is it that can give these temporary attacks? First, let's see. Standing still for a very long time. And that's why you would see that uh, no watchman stands completely still all the time. If nothing else, the person at least moves his legs a bit. Change of posture. Now, this can happen because uh, every time we say, shift our posture from lying down to standing. The blood has to be pumped against gravity in the standing posture. And uh, therefore, it could lead to a fall in blood pressure. But doesn't, because uh, there are mechanisms in the body, reflexes in the body, which uh, come into play within seconds. And therefore, as we are changing the posture, those reflexes make sure that the blood continues to flow normally to the brain, even in the standing posture. But then these reflexes can slow down. And... Uh, any function in the body deteriorates with age and therefore this type of uh, a temporary attack of low blood pressure which leads to fainting and falling is more likely in an older person than in a younger person. And uh, just as all other processes of aging are slowed down by a spiritual attitude to life through yogic practices of asanas and pranayamas, the yogic practices improve the sensitivity or reduce the slowdown of these uh, deterioration of reflexes with age. And the result is that this is less likely in a person who has been practicing these yogic uh, practices. But at the same time, aging can't be stopped. It is only slowed down. So what a person should do, irrespective of whether the person is uh, doing these practices or not, as the person gets older, if he gets the slightest warning that this type of thing is developing, as the person is changing his posture from lying down to standing, there is some sort of dizziness. What the person can do is two simple things. Most important, don't do it quickly. Uh, from lying down, come to the sitting posture. Sit for a minute or two, then stand. And another second thing, which also can be sometimes very helpful in preventing a fall. From lying down, sit up, sit for a minute or two, and then while standing, hold something. Could be take a wall support or a piece of furniture, but make sure that near the bed, there is something which you can hold that will prevent the fall. And uh, all this involves doing things consciously. And that is again a part of yoga. To do everything with full consciousness, including the asanas, is also a part of yoga. And that is another way in which yoga can help in uh, preventing this type of problems. So, standing still, change of posture. Then you know, it can be sometimes due to and being emotionally upset by anything. 
particularly many people are very sensitive to the sight of blood. Not only their own blood, see while the blood is being taken by a doctor, if they look at the syringe and the syringe getting filled up with blood, they get this attack. But uh, even somebody else's blood, somebody has been injured, they see that injured person bleeding. The person who is looking at it can also faint. So seeing blood, in severe pain, in pain uh, generally increases the blood pressure. Acute pain increases blood pressure. If the pain is very severe, instead of increasing the blood pressure, it leads to a fall in blood pressure. And that's a temporary attack. Then hunger. Being extremely hungry can also lead to low blood pressure. Hot environment. The person has been in the hot environment for some time. The person has sweated a lot, has lost water and uh, salts. And uh, that has led to this low blood pressure. And alcohol. Alcohol opens up the blood vessels, doesn't narrow them down. If the blood vessels open up, the blood pressure can fall. It's the narrowing which raises the blood pressure. It's the widening that can lead to a blood fall in the blood pressure. Treatment depends on the cause, and we'll focus on just these three. Change of posture, as we saw, change of posture should be in steps from lying down to sitting, sitting to standing, hold something while standing up, and uh, that can take care of it. Doing things consciously. Hunger, eat something, hot environment, loss of water and uh, salts. So. Uh, apart from lying down, which will prevent a fall, etc., and uh, will improve the blood flow to the brain, consume a few good helpings of uh, salt and uh, water. Salt, not just ordinary salt, preferably uh, you know the types of solutions which are used for oral rehydration, like uh, Electral or Nimbupani. That is, uh, squeeze uh, a lemon in a liter of water Add to it uh, uh, a spoon of salt. And uh, so salt plus the electrolytes in the lemon juice will take care of it. And the person may also be a little hungry. No harm in adding four spoons of sugar also to this one liter of water. Make some tasty lemonade and serve this person a few glasses in quick succession and the person will be fine. So in any case, prevention is better than cure. So when so one can prevent the blood pressure from falling by taking a few simple precautions. Early in the morning, particularly after having been in bed for several hours during uh, while asleep, sit up, sit up for a few minutes. Use that period of sitting up to pray. So sit up, pray, and then get down. And while getting down, hold something. Hunger. Don't let yourself go to that type of hunger which leads to a fall in blood pressure, hot environment. Uh, it may not be always possible to hot, uh, avoid hot environment, but one can always carry water and or some uh, lemonade along. So before anything serious happens, one can keep replacing the water and salt lost due to sweating. Protective clothing, not letting the head, head get very hot. So all those things can help in uh, uh, preventing the fall in blood pressure due to heat. And uh, again, yoga comes in, uh, reducing the possibility of low blood pressure, these attacks, a change in the attitude to life, doing things consciously, like change of posture, consciously, heeding a warning, consciously, now we return again to the more common problem, that is high blood pressure. So here is the pronouncement by the doctor, I have high blood pressure. The person is worried and anxious, but then this is not an event as we saw, this is a process. And we have tried to understand the process. And what contributed to the process was all these things, diet, physical activity, sleep, tea, coffee, smoking, and above all, chronic stress. Now, if this is taken care of, the other things would be taken care of. If this has been taken care of by going to the very root of this stress and the root lies in the way we look at life, in the type of goals that we have set for our life, in the type of priorities we have in life. 
So if that is so, then who contributed to the process? The person who looked at life in a way which was rooted primarily in physical comfort, cheap thrills, and uh, a certain so-called logical way of looking at life, which uh, calculates, calculates, and calculation is possible only in terms of concrete things. You can't calculate the level of consciousness. What you can calculate is the bank balance. So the person who was looking at these concrete things, growth in terms of concrete things like bank balance, the position that I have reached, the number of promotions that I have got, the number of awards and prizes that I have got, the number of projects I have completed successfully, the person who was counting all these things which are measurable and ignoring what cannot be measured, that is the level of consciousness. Uh, it is through this that the person contributed to the process. It is by being competitive in the unhealthy sense, being cynical, being uh, hostile, being angry at the smallest thing. Uh, it is that which contributed to the process. Now, it may look as if one is trying to make that person feel guilty. You did it to yourself. We are all human. We all do these things to some extent. The important thing is not to feel guilty, but uh, to take a constructive, positive step and uh, start changing. So the should not lead to guilt. No way. What is important is to do something positive. Yoga does not encourage going on a guilt. Yep. What it encourages is reflect and uh, see how I can redirect my life. How is it that I can do better now than I have been doing in the past. So just as rise in blood pressure is a process, growth of consciousness is also a process. So having high blood pressure is uh, not an event. The doctor only detected something that has been going on for a long time. In the same way, growth of consciousness is a continuous process. And uh, interestingly, one of these stops the other. Growth of consciousness prevents the rise in blood pressure. Now let's turn a little less serious. There's a joke. The doctor has declared I have high blood pressure and he has said I have to take these pills for the rest of my life. Okay, but why are you worried so much? You just have to take two pills a day for the rest of your life. But the doctor has written one pill twice a day for two weeks which means that the doctor has uh, told the chemist to give me only 28 pills. And that is the rest of my life. Now, rise in blood pressure is a process. So is growth of consciousness. One of these stops the other. The process of growth of consciousness stops the blood pressure from rising. Not only that, it can stop the blood pressure from killing. For one reason or the other, the person may develop a high blood pressure in spite of working on growth of consciousness, but then this blood pressure will not kill. What was Mahatma Gandhi's blood pressure? High for a very long time. At least these are two readings available. 26th October 1937, 194 by 30, 19th February 1940, 220 by 110. He had sustained high blood pressure for several decades before he was assassinated. And here is what uh, uh, the famous and eminent cardiologist Dr. B.M. Hegde has said in a six-minute video. You'll be able to find it very quickly. Just put Mahatma Gandhi blood pressure. You'll get several entries, including a six-minute video by Dr. B.M. Hegde. This is what he has said. Gandhiji's blood pressure was high. Who was losing sleep? Dr. Sushila Nair. A physician, a disciple of Mahatma Gandhi, and uh, his personal sort of physician in that sense. So she was losing sleep because he had high blood pressure and she had read in her medical uh, course all the complications of high blood pressure. Gandhiji was sleeping peacefully. So Gandhiji's blood pressure was high. Who was losing sleep? Sushila Nair. Gandhiji died of a very important complication of high blood pressure. So Dr. Hengle goes on to say, Gandhiji died of a very important complication of high blood pressure, a bullet. His kidneys were all right, his brain was all right, his heart was all right, because his mind was all right. He didn't hate anybody. 
or to put it positively, he loved everybody. So love is the key. That's what kept him, kept his kidneys, his brain, his heart, everything all right. And uh, he died of something else, the bullet. One important thing, apart from uh, uh, the major thing that is love, is uh, to worry about small things. One way to get high pressure, blood pressure is to go mountain climbing over molehills or to make a mountain out of a molehill. Now, this seems to be an innate way. This is what contributed to the blood pressure and this is what does not disappear after getting high blood pressure and being on treatment. Uh, why I put this in? Because I reminded of a person who asked me, who was on medication, and uh, he said, by mistake, today I have taken, I was prescribed one tablet or one pill. By mistake, I took two pills. Will it do any harm? And uh, should I compensate for it by skipping the next dose? Or should the next dose be still taken? So now this person, was making a mountain out of a molehill. What I told him was, if you're taking two pills instead of one, forget it, nothing will happen. If uh, taking two pills instead of one can kill a person, that drug is not in the market. It's not approved for sale. Uh, there's a safety margin which is ensured so that if instead of one, you took two pills, nothing will happen, number one. Number two, now you have two choices you are, as you're asking, whether to skip the next dose or to still take the next dose. Well, two tablets might work a little more than one tablet, and therefore better to skip the next dose. If you skip it, it's possible that the blood pressure might go up a bit till you take till the next dose. That will not do any harm. But if you let the blood pressure go down more than it should as a result of taking your next dose still at the right time, then you might get some dizziness and fainting and so on. So then you may get low blood pressure, and that can give these symptoms. So skip the next one and forget about the whole thing. So, you know, this habit of uh, making a mountain out of a molehill is also exaggerating everything. And this, again, essentially comes from chronic self-absorption. Look beyond yourself. You will not have time to think about all this. Rise in blood pressure is a process. So is growth of Consciousness, one of these stops the other. So working on growth of consciousness stops the blood pressure from rising. And therefore, this process, since these are both long processes, lifelong processes, earlier one begins on working on growth of consciousness, the better. But at the same time, it is never too late to begin. One can begin after getting the diagnosis. And in that sense, the diagnosis by the doctor is a wake-up call. Wake up call, pay heed to the call, which we all have, but we don't pay attention. As Sri says in Savitri, heaven's call is rare, rarer the heart that heeds. The doors of light are sealed to the common mind and earth's needs nail to earth the human mass. Only in an uplifting hour of stress, men answer to the touch of greater things. So heaven's call is rare, not everybody is called to aspire for union with the divine. But still rarer is the heart that pays heed to this call. The doors of light are sealed to the common mind. The doors of light, the true light, the light that gives us uh, the total truth that comes from our divine essence, the soul. The doors of light are sealed to the common mind. The common mind refuses to get illumined by the light, the all-revealing light of the soul. And earth's needs nail to earth the human mass. Where is the time to pay heed to that light? The earth's needs are so many. All the physical requirements, personal requirements, requirements of the family and friends and the society. The earth's needs nail to earth, sort of pin the person down to earth, much of humanity. Earth needs nail to earth the human mass. But then this call may be heard when only in an uplifting hour of stress, men answer to the touch of greater things. So 
it is stress it is a misfortune it is a calamity it is a traumatic event that may make the person pay heed to this call because that is when the person thinks of the one whose uh, power is unlimited for whom everything is easy one tries to get support from there one turns to this that's when one turns this call only in an uplifting hour of stress men answer men answer to this call answer to the touch of greater things so this declaration by the doctor that you have high blood pressure is one of those uplifting hours of stress take it in that spirit it's a wake up call pay attention to this call which may be rare but then with a in this uplifting hour of stress anybody can get a bit of that call a glimpse of that call at least a temporary glimpse of that call don't let it disappear don't pay this don't let this attention to this call disappear hold on to it and work on the growth of consciousness which is what uh, listening to this call will do and the blood pressure the rise of blood pressure the high blood pressure will only serve as a wake up call you will find uh, much of what we have talked in this book back to health through yoga which is available both in print as does an ebook on amazon and other such platforms and the anatomical picture of the heart shown at the beginning of this presentation uh, was taken from totoro and dabowski's principles of anatomy and physiology a beautiful book this is a picture postcard view of the inside of the meditation hall of shirobindo ashram delhi branch to which you are all welcome and of course for questions and comments apart from what you may ask now at the uh, end of this session towards the end of the session you can always drop an email to yes at yesspirituality.com gratitude to the mother and shirobindo for uh, making these sessions possible and uh, thank you for being there and listening patiently to such a long session we can close today's session and thank you everyone we end with a short silence